Good afternoon and welcome back to day one of COGX 2020. This is the cutting edge stage. My name is Anushka Sharma and I'm here to take you through the proceedings today. I sometimes wish you could actually understand and listen to some of the tidbits that we hear in the green room, but you don't have long to wait before you hear from our next panel direct. This is the cutting edge stage. We're talking about technology that's coming up over the next 12 to 18 months that's really cutting edge and at the bleeding edge of technology. And it's here to inform you on this platform of how that might fit into your, your strategy over the next 10, well, five to 10 years. Now to introduce uh, the Director of AI and Data Economy at Innovate UK, Zoe Webster, who will be leading our next session. Over to you, Zoe. Thank you very much, Anishka. Great to be here. I remember being here last year, um, different circumstances, but um, but really great to hear about some of the cutting edge developments that are going on right now and what they might mean to you and your, your ventures. Um, so we're here to talk, first of all, about empathetic AI and what that means. Essentially, this is around thinking about empathy in the context of AI. And rather than having empathy as a kind of a tick box, to tick off when you're developing AI to make sure you're, you know, you're, you're fulfilling that. It's actually about putting that at the heart of what AI is doing and delivering, putting empathy and emotion at its very heart and have, helping to, to have that set to the intentions going forward. Got an amazing panel of speakers to talk to you now about what that means to them and what they're doing to develop empathetic AI going forward. Now, first of all, I'm gonna introduce you to our first speaker our keynote speaker for this session, uh, Dr. Philippe Baudouin. He co-founded Element AI, um, a world leader operationalizing AI for businesses. Um, in his latest venture, um, which he started this year, he and his team are creating an empathetic AI that curates personalized content for the person we wish we were. This new startup recently secured seed funding from Founder Fuel, one of Canada's most prominent tech accelerators. So really pleased to welcome you, Philippe, to the, the stage. Please go ahead. Thanks a lot, Zoe. Um, thanks. So um, yes, as, as you mentioned, uh, starting with a little keynote presentation here, um, maybe we can go to the first slide. There you go. So um, yeah, I'd like to start this story um, you know, a few decades in the past. Uh, at first, you know, there was the internet, there was the web, and these things uh, came with big dreams. Talking about this dream, uh, the inventor of the World Wide Web, Sir uh, Tim Berners-Lee, once said that the web is more a social creation than a technical one. He said, I designed it for a social effect, to get people to work together. And so now the dreams of that era came to a swift close as gigantic media corporations took over and they started, started filling our feeds and our lives, not with what we want, but with what they assume that we want. So today we're left in a disease days and we're unable to decipher what is real, what is fake, what is good and what is evil. So we've known for a while now that the way we've been consuming information just isn't working. We are tangled up in algorithms that are definitely good for large tech companies, but definitely not good for us. So look, the habits we formed using this, these platforms, these habits are hard to break, right? Especially since the delivery mechanisms themselves are kind of designed to make us addicted, right? The lure of social media and the empty dopamine hits that it provides are by design irresistible. So how did we get here? Where did we go wrong? There's been many hypotheses suggested over the years to explain that, but I'd like to suggest one new one, one new hypothesis today. Because of these, algor because of these algorithms and what they do to us, we're simply not ourselves when we're on the internet. In fact, I'd be bold and I will say that we're much better people than what we look like on the internet. So then the question becomes, who are we? It's an important question and it seems to be the question that all the big web giants are trying to answer every day, right? They profile us, they model us through our clicks, 
through our likes, through the speed at which we scroll on their mobile apps. They, they, you know, you, they measure that. And they even go so far as to pretend that they know us better than we know ourselves. I beg to differ. Most of these clicks and these likes and these scrolls are happening beyond our consciousness. We are not consciously aware of the impact of our actions on the algorithms that have so, so much impact on our lives. So in a sense, our clicks are very shallow signals that we're sending and that are being used to train our algorithms. In turn, as they, as they mean, once they're trained, these algorithms send us shallow recommendations, naturally, you know. And these posts that they give us, they give us back, they're meant to trigger our emotions, to make us more anxious, to trigger our anger, our to polarize us or divide us. They're doing anything they need to do in order to get that next click or to get that next like. And since we spend so much time with these algorithms, well, they eventually get to us. These shallow recommendations make us shallower, at least online. So this diet of shallow signals, which is being fed to our algorithms, well, this diet is born from an almost universally held belief in the Silicon Valley, something that I would call the myth of frictionlessness. This myth goes as such. It says that any piece of technology can be made better if we reduce friction. And at first glance, it makes a lot of sense. If you are there to you know, make some piece of technology that makes our life easier, then if it takes something difficult and it makes it simpler, it's always better, right? Well, the thing is that there are many different kinds of difficult. There is this kind. That's the type of difficult work we definitely want to get rid of, right? Because this difficult work doesn't define who we want to be. That's why we buy a dishwasher, or that's why the first person who invents a machine that can fold your laundry is going to you know, become a millionaire. But then there's this other kind of difficult work, the blank page the white paper, total freedom to write your own story, to decide who you want to be. That's difficult. There's no social platform that would ever dare put their users in front of a white page like that, even if it allowed them to understand users better because it causes too much friction. It would send all their metrics in a tailspin conversion rate, click-through rate, engagement, time on platform, all the numbers the large tech companies or even any company in the Valley, all the numbers they care for would crash instantly if we asked users to, uh, to face a white page like that. So what do they do? Well, they reduce friction. They give us simple buttons that we can click mindlessly. They measure signals we're not even aware we're emitting. And the reward is better metrics for them. But the cost? The cost is shallow signals. And the cost is shallow users, shallow you. So how do we fix this? First, we have to give up on the myth of frictionlessness. We have to realize that the only way to understand people is to give them a space in which they can stop and think. A space in which they can use their own words rather than the ones we put in their mouth. So that's what empathetic AI is about. In a sense, empathetic AI is not so much a new invention as it is a new intention. It proposes to use recent advances in natural language understanding so that we can let people express their wants and their needs in a more nuanced way. It proposes to embrace the friction that it creates. Empathetic AI is inviting us to move away from the current trend of in-your-face technology and towards by-your-side technology. 
That intention is not an easy one to embrace, however. As we've seen, empathetic AI increases friction, and therefore it's not compatible with Silicon Valley's favorite metrics. If we ask a user to stop and think, well, there's a chance they will decide to simply leave our website or you know, quit our mobile app. But, you know, as technologists, it might be a risk we need to take today. Otherwise, we risk simply not understanding our users. There's something else that empathetic AI is not compatible with, and it's Silicon's Valley, Silicon Valley's favorite business model, advertising. There is no way we can create a space in which people will thoughtfully express their wants and needs if they believe that our ultimate goal is to push them advertising. So we have to give up on our beloved metric, and now we have to give up on our, our beloved revenue stream. That's a tough thing to ask. Now, there's a third thing that empathetic AI is not. It doesn't have to be boring. Yes, it's difficult to fill an empty page, and no, we don't want to put words in your mouth, but we can still make the journey incredibly fun. Empathetic AI is about all the ways in which we can spark the imagination of people and we can help them find their own words. The words that will empower them so that they can take control back over their algorithms. There's an ide idealist named Vincerf who once said about the internet, which he happened to have co-invented. If we do not like what we see in that mirror, the problem is not to fix the mirror, we have to fix society. Well, I believe we broke Vint's mirror, and I believe we need empathetic AI to fix it so that we can go back to an internet that shows us as we really are rather than as these distorted shallow images we project today. If we do this, then we may be able to provide a better answer to the most important question, who are we? And if we pr provide a better answer to that question, then if we are able to let these better version of ourselves shine online, then we may be able to bring back the dreams of the founders of the internet. Thank you very much. And if you're interested in empathetic AI, just wanted to point out a couple of links here on that last slide. Uh, we are just building a startup that is putting empathetic AI at the core of our product. Uh, we're still in stealth mode, so you'll find us at stealthstartup4.com. But if you're interested in the topic, you can follow that space. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Philippe. That was fascinating. Um, and before I introduce the, the other speakers, and we'll have some um, discussion as a panel, I just wanted to remind you uh, to use Slido if you've got any questions for the panel. We'll come to those later. I think you'll find the, the code in on, on the platform. Um, I think it's 3056 with a V at the front, maybe. But that, that's something that we'll have checked for you. So if you've got any questions, do note them and, and send them through Slido. And we can pick them up. A little later. So now we'll come to our other speakers on the panel. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to uh, Christine, Amber, and Jonathan. So Christine Gloria, uh, Dr. Christine Gloria, forgive me, is Associate Pro Director of Emerging Technologies for Aspen Digital, a policy program of the Aspen Institute. Her work focuses on the nexus of trust and emerging technologies. Uh, specifically, she leads the Virtually Human Project, which examines the opportunities for and challenges of continuous and Ubiquitous, ubiquitous digital connection on individuals and meaningful social connections. Next up, we've got Amber Case, who's um, a futurist, author, and researcher. She studies the interaction between humans and computers and how our relationship with information is changing the way cultures think, act, and understand their worlds. She's a researcher at the Institute for the Future and the author of Calm Technology and Designing with Sound. Amber has received multiple awards and was named one of Inc. Magazine's 30 Under 30 and Fast Company's Most Influential Women in Technology. 
And Jonathan Morgan um, is founder and CEO of Yonder. Prior to Yonder, he published research about extremist groups manipulating social media with the Brookings Institution, The Atlantic and The Washington Post, presented at NATO's Center of Excellence for Defense Against Terrorism, the United States Institute for Peace and the African Union. Jonathan also served as an advisor to the US State Department, developing strategies for digital counterterrorism. He regularly provides commentary about online disinformation for publications such as the New York Times, NBC, NPR, and wired. So thank you very much for panel members for joining us. Everyone's got so much to contribute. And I'm looking forward to, to hearing your questions for them a bit later. So they're each going to speak in turn. So um, Christine, if you wouldn't mind taking the floor. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Philippe, for that wonderful presentation. I think it set us up quite lovely um, into what I hope this discussion will evolve into. I just wanted to quickly point out that with the Virtually Human Project, particularly um, in the approach at Aspen, we look at what exactly Philippe was explaining it very nicely in his slide deck about the idea both of the lens of the individual. So how does the technology impact the person's emotional, uh, behavioral and psychological, um, like how does that manifest in their lives based on the interaction with the technology? And then how does that inform our technology design in the uh, later, which leads to the social connection portion, right? So with all of the potential interactions that we're having, particularly virtually online, through Facebook, through Google, through you name it, there's so many, um, what is sustainable, what is not sustainable, um, given how we've been pre you know, put together a program to have social connections. What does that mean in the future? And then lastly, trying to really understand where the business case is here, right? Because as Philippe was saying, there is not, this is not, does not fit into the Silicon Valley mode of um, working with advertising, with understanding uh, what, what will make money from this, right? We're all still trying to operate um, in, the economy. So trying to figure out where the business case is here. And I think the, you know, what we're seeing with COVID and what we're seeing particularly in the US with the um, protesters is a lot of instances where technology and um, our understanding of technology and its impact and influence and integration in our lives um, is full steam. And we're seeing where things are just falling short. And whether that it's whether that's a government policy question, whether that's a platform question, I think we're starting to realize, and excellently, like Philip Philippe said, who are we? What does this really mean for us as a society and as for individuals? And I think we're in a really, um, I'm going to be positive here, an opportun opportunistic um, moment that we can kind of reassess how we're going to apply what we understand about being human, what we want to be about, and how society will get there, and then put the correct, um, gar uh, you know, correct uh, metrics and or rail guards that we need um, on the policy side to help us uh, get to get to a future that we actually want to be a part of. So I'll leave it at that. I look forward to hearing uh, what else everyone has to say and jumping into conversation. That's great. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, before we come to our next speaker, I just want to make sure um, I let you know that the um, the Slido code is actually V3722 for this session. <laughs> so that's, hopefully that's useful information, but please do send your questions through. Um, now, Amber, I'd like to invite you to, to step up and, and give your perspective. Thank you. It's really wonderful to be here. Uh, I'd like to give a, a short talk about building technology at human scale and what that actually means. The concept of human scale is partially from architecture theory, but it's also much more indigenous in origin, the idea that you could make something with the resources around you, that you're connected to a local ecosystem, and what distance actually means when we're, working, uh, when we're talking about operating at scale. Um, I also tried to outline some principles for empathetic automation, um, and I'll, I'll share those a little bit too. Uh, but I'd like to begin with a quick story. A few years ago, I was in Kerala, India for a developer conference. And there was this wonderful woman that took the stage and she gave this amazing story. She said, look, I came from this engineering family. I was into math, I was into science. 
and I was really good at it. I was an exceptional programmer, but I decided I wanted to be a designer. So I Googled how to be a designer. And one of the things that it said that I needed to be was somebody with empathy. She said, I had never heard of empathy before. I don't know what that is. You know, math, science, what's, what's empathy? So she looked up what empathy was and she said, okay, I'm just going to have to learn empathy. And over the, the course of a, of a couple of years, working with the definition of empathy, of the ability to understand and share the feelings of another, she became an exceptional user experience designer and holds a very high level position at Microsoft and is helping to restructure a lot of the divisions of the company. This was a fascinating story for me because I grew up in a very similar family. Um, I grew up, I guess you'd call it like a third generation AI family. My grandpa worked on the fourth node of ARPANET at the University of Utah, which was the first internet. Um, he worked on AI systems and 3D computing. My dad worked on voice concatenation systems and automated phone trees at a big telecom company. And when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, our Sunday conversations were all about ethics and empathy and AI. Can an AI have feeling? Can you train an AI to be like a human? Can an AI understand what it feels like to touch grass on a July day when it's cool outside and you just had a nice barbecue with your family? What does that mean? Are our machines more important than people? Are trees more important than people? And I, we would just argue and fight. And I would always take the idea, the, the kind of nasty idea that like te technology should just keep going. It doesn't matter, you know, people are dumb. <laughs> and, and my dad was trying to give me an ethical and empathetic education while I got so excited about the family Atari and I wanted to program and all I wanted to do was have black and white answers. I wanted to do mathematics. And I kind of realized later on after I kind of burnt out that um, I, I was missing something. And so it wasn't until I decided to go to college that I called my mom's best friend up and I said, hey, you know, Carmen, you're a fantastic um, mathematician. I wanna become a mathematician or a programmer. I wanna go to MIT or Caltech. What should I do? She said, well, don't do any of that. You should learn how to think. You know, you, you, you should learn some ethics. You should go to a liberal arts college and you should learn something else. Pick the subject that you're the worst at in school and do that. <laughs> so I got a scholarship to Lewis and Clark College and I majored in anthropology and sociology because I got Ds at some point in social studies, but I was always 100% straight A student in math and science. And what I learned in those anthropology classes by writing my thesis on mobile phones in 2007, right about when the iPhone came out, was that my ideas about the world needed to be significantly expanded if I were to be able to make technology that worked well for people. It was really, really tough <laughs> learning these things. And I think, you know, my, my question always has been, can people learn empathy? And if you have people coming out of college immediately who are like me, <laughs> um, who just wanted to do math and science and they go immediately into creating what they think could be a perfect system where there's no flaws from a mathematical universe, then you have an issue where you have people just blaming somebody if they don't use the system right. It's not that we're bad at technology. A lot of the technology is bad at us. And a lot of times when I see automated systems, uh, I see people apologizing on behalf of them. I see an automated check-in counter and it doesn't work. And so the, the person at the front counter apologizes. They say, I'm so sorry. I, didn't, I wasn't able to, to make this work for you. And I think one of the reasons why is that we're operating at remote control. Uh, developers are developing for unseen people. And so if we actually recenter technology to where people can actually operate it uh, close to themselves and change it for their own needs, there's ways that we can have our own empathy for our communities and how we know about what we need be operated into the system. And developers building these flexible platforms where we can see what's being done in the background and there's transparency 
and they can actually feel and see how we're experiencing the system um, could lead to a more empathetic understanding of what people really need and less of a blame on people aren't doing things the right way um, and the consequences of that. So that's a short thing I'll wrap up. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Amber, that was great, thank you. Jonathan, can I invite you to the stage, please? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you um, for the invitation, and and uh, and I really appreciate the um, uh, just the. Uh, this has been a really provocative conversation already, so hopefully I can add something at least a little bit meaningful. Uh, I'll I'll do my best to keep up. Um, but I w I wanted to follow on a little bit from what um, from what Amber was saying. You brought up a really interesting point about this, like I think this dichotomy between the this like uh, objective kind of rational world of math and programming and this more kind of empathetic human world and really trying to figure out how we can blend the two together. And I have, um, uh, my my experience has been very similar where I took a detour after high school. Um, you know, most of my career has been focused on technology, but my, my university degree was actually in performing arts. I went to a performing arts conservatory um, and learned how to make uh, like shared human experience, like based on common empathy. That was, that's, that's more or less the goal when you get right down to the nuts and bolts of kind of why live performance and these shared experiences are essential. And then, uh, and then like a lot of people with that background, uh, quickly discovered that the, uh, a career in technology is equally as rewarding and, and, and a little bit more viable. And so like back off the technology, back down the technology path I went, but like the blend between those two disciplines is kind of deep understanding of how uh, how machines reason about the world and this deep understanding about how humans experience shared empathy, I think really led me to believe that there's, it's it's essential that we blend these two disciplines um, in the way that the other panelists, I think, are already advocating. Um, and we we have models for this. There's actually, a, um, I think the, the disciplines of interaction and user experience design actually give us this sense of how do we focus on a human-centered approach to creating a, a more of a dialogue or a collaboration with technology, as opposed to, like Amber was just saying, this idea of like this idealized idea of a complete system um, that is flawless, that is inherently objective, um, that makes decisions in a way that uh, is almost like a little bit smarter than the humans, like kind of like does things on their behalf, or like Philippe was saying, kind of creates, curates content in a way that assumes it understands what the user wants or what the user is trying to accomplish, but with actually out without engaging in, in a dialogue with any individual human being. And so like, this is a big thing at, at, at Yonder, we talk in a similar way that Philippe was talking about kind of empathetic AI, we talk a lot about an authentic internet at Yonder. Um, and we talk a lot about authenticity and what creates an authentic human experience online. And so it, in a way, I think this is a course correction of this, this kind of generic idea about social interaction online that every, every input is identical, um, that there's wisdom in the crowd, and that somehow uh, the, the sum total of all of our interactions produces some kind of you know, latent value or kind of um, that, that that's somehow representative of the human experience. And I think we've all discovered over the past three or four years in particular that that's just, that's not true. Um, there's inherent bias in, in every human experience. There's inherent subjectivity in every human experience and that's baked into our technology. And we can't wish that away just by trying to do like machine learning at scale or trying to have kind of smart machines operating at scale. And so I think this um, moving towards a model that is as emotionally satisfying as our human to human interactions is, is, is essential. It's where we need to go next as technologists. And so in a very practical way, um, I'm interested in the like the the shared kind of blending of different ideas different ideas for artificial intelligence so blending this idea that there's a we, we, as human beings we have a shared structure for our belief systems um, that organizes all of our collective and individual experiences we've kind of designed our subjective interpretation of the world in a way that all of us can understand together um, and then so there's some relationship between what's called symbolic artificial intelligence and some aspects of deep learning like reinforcement uh, kind of uh, uh, reinforcement learning, um, uh, transfer learning. These are very much in this mode of like uh, artificial intelligence or technologies as a tool for kind of a, um, a more of a dialogue design-based way of um, augmenting, accelerating, and kind of benefiting from human intuition by assuming that humans are individuals, they're messy, um, but they're also smart and they understand what they want. 
um, and they can be partners in discovering what the technology is supposed to accomplish as opposed to being um, almost like uh, <laughs> almost like shoved to the side. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Um, I'm really looking forward to the conversation. I think this is a really fantastic panel um, with folks who have a lot of uh, great ideas about how technology can evolve to be more human. That's great. Thank you so much. There's already get, get some questions in, which is fantastic. Um, I think there's a couple, a few questions around the difference between empathy and sympathy, and I just wondered if perhaps Amber or Christine could could, could say something about the differences and whether it is empathetic or, or sympathetic AI we need. So I'll I'll kind of I'll just jump in here from a mm -hmm. um, traditional you know, psychology standpoint is that we've, we've understood empathy to be both the, um, the understanding of someone else's being or feelings, and then being able to then reciprocate that. There is a lot of talk specifically now in terms of how that's being captured within the AI world is cognitive empathy. So you could essentially train a system to do the processes, right? To do the process of empathy, but not necessarily return, um, reciprocate the empathy to the user itself. So there's there's a little bit of work there. I would, I would say, and this is just kind of my personal understanding of it, is that sympathy plays almost a branch off between empathy, right? Because it's like, a, it's, it's a, it's a, a reaction to, but not necessarily a reaction to an understanding, but not necessarily a um, a two way conversation. Whereas empathy, as I've mentioned before to the panelists, is this idea that there's a lived experience that comes to inform both the understanding and the reciprocation of the feeling or the emotion itself. Thank you, Amber. I think you had something to say on this as well. There we go. Yeah, I, I, I've just been thinking about empathy and sympathy and in terms of just having people available from lots of different fields in a space, which is a little bit of a tangent, but thinking about Xerox Park, where there, there was deliberately hired anthropologists and historians and, and artists to counter this kind of all all the, the very specific perspective of programming. And then also the idea that originally it was the arts and the sciences and they were bonded together. Um, so there was this idea that, you know, artists would have empathy and sympathy and that they were hanging out alongside people who were developing the technologies. And that's what, how we got the graphic user interface to begin with. And the idea of, of te technology should be a pass through technology, that technology can be invisible in that you don't focus on the task, but the tool uh, and, and the idea of a kind of craft um, that's associated with it. I, I just keep thinking about that, um, even though I, I never necessarily have the best definitions for each of the sympathy and, and empathy, it just seems like um, I, I always question whether these things can scale, like whether they work at scale or whether they need to be considered in small groups and, and communities. So in using technology at, at an enormous scale, can you actually have um, empathy? Or is it something that, that needs to be formed, you know, on, on small forums and, and small, uh, small craft? So I think that, that really helpful. And actually one of the things I want to pick up on, uh, kind of bouncing off that is, is Christine, you mentioned lived experience. Um, and I'm trying to imagine how we could possibly give AI lived experience or a sense of right. that to enable empathy. Can you say a bit, how, how far can that go? Right. I'm about failing. So I think it's kind of, uh, it's quite interesting because uh, usually this is when the movie Her comes into discussion points. And um, you think about, well, yeah, you could essentially program uh, a an AI that has all types of experiences, multiple experiences from multiple perspectives, right? And so if that's the case and you can, uh, then would the reciprocation of the empathy be genuine, right? That's the second half of that question. And I think um, we as humans, I, I actually think that an AI could quote unquote have a lived experience if it's if we're just looking at it as those data points that a person can have, um, you know, celebrating a birthday, um, but whether or not they can then uh, 
use that to reciprocate to a human, whether a human can feel as if it is being reciprocated is a whole different set of questions that we, one, don't have measurements for. We don't know how that would work. Um, and to a language to kind of understand how we would even ask that question to a human. Uh, here, here's a robotic, here's a robotic seal. Do you feel, you know, how is that, what is that, uh, relationship or that interaction with you and we've heard we've seen lots of stories here right where people do reciprocate to a to the the paro right or to their or to their roomba about um how they you know that relationship the the detriment there is what philippe was i think pointing to is that other half of that circle is then we are then given recommendations that are based on what these really un underexplored um, uh, responses are between that human and the and the uh, robot or the the system that I think is problematic, and we just we just don't know how to do that quite yet. I but to whether or not you know you could give an AI lived experience if we're measuring it by the fact that you know, it can, it can um, have a birthday, it can be yelled at if, you know, sure. Right. I mean, the, 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 the developers have lived experience. I guess there's, yeah. there's something around that. So um, I know Philippe and Jonathan want to come in here. So Philippe, did you want to? Yeah. So um, I love the way you're, you're putting it, right. As you say, Christina, like um, this idea of empathetic AI, it, it summons the, the, uh, you know, images of her and automated agents that really get us. Mm -hmm. But I think what I wanted to draw the attention to is, you know, AI is sure the agent you interact with, but AI is also the entire process you yep. build around, you know, the, 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 the user experience. And in terms of empathetic AI here, I, I believe it's more, much more about the intentions we have coming into the process of building a system that will assist the user than it is about the system itself. If coming into that process, our goal is to understand the user better, I think this is where we're being empathetic. And it's, it's you know, it's the designers as much as the AI itself that, that demonstrates empathy in a case like this. And what I believe has been happening is we left that behind. We, because, you know, we fell in love with data-driven design and like, and, and for, and data-driven became a very narrow definition of data. It became quantitative data. Mm -hmm. Can you show me numbers? But these numbers, they capture something like very, like very raw and it's not the nuances that we need in order to understand humans. So I guess my, my call for empathetic AI is more a call about, you know, empathetic AI design, right? Can we actually think of the people as we design our systems and remember that people are not on our website to spend more time and they're not there to click more mm -hmm. and they're not there to convert. They're there for something else. And we have to figure this out and we have to, to acknowledge that we won't be able to do this through the numbers we collect today. Yeah, thank you. A good time to bring Jonathan in on the design point, I think. <laughs> I, I think that that's a really salient point to talk about the design of these systems. And I, I think we often talk about this problem in, in terms of scale. And I, I actually think as technologists, because we haven't been very um, empathetic or thoughtful or intentional in how we've designed these systems, um, that we've, we're, we're trying to scale at the wrong point in the system. We're trying to scale at the quantitative computation layer of the systems so that we can have under this assumption, which I think is a fallacy, that more more data points will it, somehow, if we could just get enough different inputs about the user, then we would that uh, some understanding of them or some empathy would 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 emerge, as if it were latent in all of these different data points about things that we click on on the internet. And I think actually what we want is more. We want to scale the part of the system where technologists, I think, can have a lot of empathy for the user, which is like, what's the actual, what's the most relevant. Um, what's the most specific, what's the most contextual, what's the most rich data that we can put in front of the user or that we can use to get a better understanding of who they are. And those choices are almost editorial and they require a lot of human empathy. I think they require a lot of intuition about what users are trying to accomplish. But then it means that the kind of machine learning or AI driven approaches that we use to help interact with the user, then we're, we're actually working on more like, like small batch artisanal data. <laughs> like it's the, uh, it's, it's you know it's the Portland version of data science as opposed to the New York City version of data science, and like I, I think that the um, I, that actually 
it includes much more like it's easier to reason about. I think it's easier for technologists, it's easier for designers, and it's easier for users to to collaborate around um, really curating um, like that data curation process. And then it makes the AI and ML um, significantly easier to accomplish and, and much less of a black box. I, I had a couple of questions. I hope no one draws a link between them. But the the first one is around how much technology developers really should care. You know, should have empathy and, and actually should care. I think one of the questions we've had is about you know revenue models and given that they are there to drive traffic and to drive profit. You know, really, how much should they care about the user? Philip, maybe that this comes from your keynote earlier. Uh, yeah. So, I mean. <laughs> if you stop thinking about the user to think about profit, I, I believe there's there's something a bit off in the business model here. It's like, or or it's it's optimizing for shorter term stuff. Uh, at the end of the day, if if someone comes and cares about the user more than you do, they will they will win the user. Right? Well, no but, matter but, how, how much money you can uh, squeeze out of your process. Uh, I think this leads on to the second question, which I hope people don't link too much, is that that's come from the audience about you. Know, psychopaths don't have empathy but can learn it from others um are we in danger there is there a risk that we all simply have ai basically a psychopath <laughs> um uh, yeah that that sounds quite a scary future is that something you you think is a, a genuine risk uh, are you asking me <laughs> i think that is no no but i mean i like a word about that again uh i i think we're we're uh really far from like uh a little AI companion that will be able to experience the world and you know connect with us at the emotional level. Uh, I think the empathy that I'm calling for again is more from you know how do we design AI uh, in an empathetic way more than um, so yeah AI psychopaths. Um, there there's a future that has that has AI psychopaths in them. I hope it's not the one we're building. I think that well, yes, ditto. I think um, Christine and Amber. I think. Yeah, so that's a really great question because I think there's a lot of studies in the psychology on the psychology realm that show that you can teach it and 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 uh, the extent to which that might be applied into AI is where uh, the under forming the correct language and understanding that this is a potential framework by which we need to both design the AI but understand the AI is crucial for policy making for governance structures like this is this is how we then create the guardrails we need in order to protect us from things that could go off the rail uh, like uh, a psychopathic AI. Thank you Emba. I think you wanted to add something. I'm going to say that we already have psychopathic AIs all over the place. <laughs> they're they're everywhere. They're um they're in systems that help judges uh, determine whether somebody should go back into prison or not. And uh, under the guise of empathy, they actually just uh, put in the, the the racism of the of the system that they came from. And the judge can then say, "Oh, well, the AI told me to do it, and the AI is perfect, and therefore I can just uh, systematically perpetuate whatever uh, is there." And I think there's there's other systems that might be sociopathic where it's you know just a just a parking meter that um, there's no way to tell somebody that it's stuck there's no way to to have somebody have it work out there you know it it doesn't have any empathy with anybody and reduce you know they're all built for somebody who can see a size eight font they're not uh, working with people who have arthritis and I think one of the biggest issues is that a developer can get hired on to do a thing they get they might get hired right out of college and they never experience they never even see it um, the the people who whose lives are being affected by using that system the millions of people for you know they spent maybe a week thinking about it because they were on a deadline and then they have something unfunctional and then they get mad when when somebody says hey this is terrible and here's a bug report but if they were actually able to be there with somebody to experience what it was like or trapped in a room with their own device, maybe they might um, change it. And, and a lot of companies do not have that. I know that at Airbnb, they actually had pods that you would sit in and you would listen to frustrated customer calls so that you could experience uh, you know, your design decisions. And that really changed how a lot of people built their systems over there. Thank you, Amber. And just to wrap up because I think we've got a minute left. One of the questions that came in was, you know, what practical steps 
can we all take to drive the change needed for empathetic AI? If I turn to you for, for, for 20 seconds each, you know, what single practical step would you recommend that people take or look at taking to, to drive the required change? So perhaps we can start with you, Philippe. Yeah, I would say whenever you make a design decision, ask yourself, is the user spending time thinking as they do that interaction? If they're not, then please don't overweight that signal as you try to train an AI system. That's great. Thank you. Christine? Um, I would just make sure that it's a there's diversity in both the process that you're um, putting together and in the user base that you're trying to make for to allow for the different perspectives to be included. Fantastic, thank you. Amber? Uh, I think whenever making a design decision, consider what it would feel like if you used it and whether it would be reasonable uh, if other people in your family in different social classes uh, were possible to use it <laughs> instead of uh, instead of an abstract. That's, that's really helpful, thank you. And Jonathan? Uh, yeah, I, I'd advocate for technologists at every part of the, um, of the design process for an AI system from data acquisition to data processing to the, uh, to the, to the modeling work that, um, that, that I think it's the primary amount of focus in these sorts of conversations is really look to the practice of um, human-centered design, really to teach yourself how to find that empathy in a technology context. So to Amber's point, you can put yourselves in the in the position of a user to imagine what it would feel like to interact with the technology that you're building and understand what that shared experience will be. Um, and then, you know, use your best judgment at all times. That's amazing. Great advice from everyone, some practical steps. Thank you so much to the panel, to Philippe, to Amber, to Christine and to Jonathan. It's been a great discussion. Thank you so much, everyone, for your questions. I will now hand back over to Anishka. Thank you all so much. I don't know about you, but I'm one of those people that loves these conversations. And I had goosebumps all the way through that panel. Empathy, sympathy, technology, designing technology for humanity is one of the things that um, we've really been enriched with some fantastic insights from our panel. So huge thank you to Amber, Christine, Philippe, Jonathan, and of course, Zoe. This is the cutting edge stage. It's day one of COGX 2020. This is where you learn about bleeding technology, what, what sort of um, themes you can take to grow your business strategy over the next 10, well, five to 10 years. We're actually going to be running our next session in about 13 minutes. So back here at 6 p.m. UK time. And we're actually going to be talking about generalized artificial intelligence, the next decade for AI. So we really hope that you'll come back and join us. We love the engagement on Slido. Keep getting those questions in. Share it on Twitter with the hashtag COGX2020. And we really look forward to seeing you back here at the Cutting Edge stage very soon. Thank you. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.